Welcome to the second season of the podcast Rise and Play. We are Sophie Vaux and Carla Reyes, your hosts for this special season. In this series, we will focus on portraits of women who have an outstanding career in games. How did they get into games? How did they reach their high position and career? What have been their personal and career choices to get to their level, and why? We want to bring more light to the wide range of career paths available for women in leadership positions in the industry. And we hope this will inspire you to aim for higher in your career too. Let's begin. So today, I'm super excited to have Sarah Fuchs with me for this new episode of Rise and Play. And to tell more about Sarah, Sarah has over 20 years of experience making games. For the past 12 years, she has been focusing exclusively on mobile. Most recently, she was the VP and GM of a number one fashion game, Covet Fashion. Prior to that, Sarah worked on Sims Mobile, various mobile titles at NG Moko and Dina, as well as Spore, X-Men, the official game, The Sims 2, The Godfather, and James Bond, Everything or Nothing. So Sarah is currently consulting and is constantly looking for ways to help level the playing field for women in games. She is head of mobile at Wings, starting a new company and consulting on projects that she finds meaningful. So hey, Sarah. Hi, Sophie. Very pleased to have you. I'm so excited. And what a track record. I'm very impressed. <laughs> Thank you. I'm so excited to be here. So let's begin with that, with this excitement. So what is the most exciting thing you are working on at the moment? Well, I've got a number of exciting projects, but one of the things that I'm doing is I'm the head of mobile for Wings, which is an organization and a fund that helps fund indie game developers who are women or of a marginalized gender. So we are looking for funding and we're also looking for games to fund. So I'm very excited that I get to be able to do that. I'm also working on a couple of projects. One is a mobile game surrounding climate change. One is a game that's going to change people's relationship, hopefully with technology. And then one is an NFT fashion space game. Wow. So I do know Wings as well because we had Audrey as well on the Audrey Le Prince on the podcast. So I'm super happy to have you on board and starting the initiative on mobile. You were GM also at Covet Fashion, to Glue Mobile, and it's a very typical free-to-play game. And when I hear your recent projects, which are more towards climate change, uh, the relationship even to technology, like what are we doing with the games we are making, scaling, marketing, and also helping to have a new type of entrepreneurs in the mobile space. What led you to this decision of, it's not a 360, 180, you know, something mm -hmm. very, very different towards others and helping sustainability? Well, it's been 20 years that I've been making games traditionally. With Covet, I was able to really bring more women into leadership. We had a leadership team of seven people, only one of whom was a male. And when I started in games, I was among, you know, there's one woman on the team and that was me. And, or maybe then it got to be three women and one of them was me. And it's really important for me that people who make games look like the people who play the games. And so I'm really passionate about wings. I'm also doing mentorship with teenagers and college students to help give them a path into games. So it's just something I'm really passionate about. There was a lot of time spent proving myself in games. And now that, you know, EA acquired Glue, that was the opportunity for me to really say, okay, I'm not going to work for EA a fourth time. I'm going to go out and find projects that really are meaningful to me that aren't just about making money. Because I have this great position where I can use what I've learned and use my connections to help make the world a better place through games. And to be able to have a platform in which to do that, to take several chances, it's just really exciting for me. It's what I want to do. I feel like games are not just games. They are a connection or they are a teaching method. Sometimes they are just games, but I want to make something more and I want to really bring women into games. And I want to really think about the impact that we have on the environment. And then I want to think about we're spending so much time on these mobile devices. What's that doing to us? So it's just wonderful to be able to have the opportunity to try and make a difference. You seem to have quite strong clarity on how you want to spend time on these different projects, initiatives that seem very complementary. So I'm curious, what was the process for you to get to this decision and these specific initiatives? Well, I have four kids. And I know that's not the answer that you that you thought I was going to say, but I have four kids. And it's very important to me to spend time with them. And so if I'm going to do something that's going to take me away from spending time with my kids, I want it to be something that I'm passionate about. 
And I look at where we are right now in the global climate crisis. Like if we do not do something about climate change within the next few years, then we're not going to have a whole lot of years left. Climate is so important to me and it should be important to everybody. And with mobile gaming, you have the opportunity to reach 2.6 billion people. What other platform do you have that can reach that many people? So if you can create a game that's engaging and will bring people in and also make them not just aware, but want to act to improve the environment, for me, there was that real clarity. The other thing was my passion for bringing women into game development. I've spent so many years being the only one, the only person at the table And what I found when working on Covet was having all of those other women seated at the table. We doubled our bookings in three years on Covet Fashion. It's pretty remarkable. And we did that having a team of women leaders. And so we just need to make that the norm. And then you think about all the time we're spending with technology. Is that a healthy relationship? And so hashtag self-care and the work that True Love is doing was a really natural place for me to also step in. And lastly, the NFT space is really interesting. I'm working on a project, an unannounced project, but it's table stakes for me that this project is environmentally friendly, that we are doing good for humanity. So those are the projects I'm working on. That was my motivation. And I'm really excited to be able to do them. Yeah, that's very inspiring. Sometimes I wonder, are we a bigger movement or are we still a small segment? And I have a feeling sometimes that these initiatives, although very important, are missing of attention or support on a bigger scale. If you could share more of a reality about it, that would be great. Yeah, well, you know, I think money is a big driver. We have to pay our employees. We have to make money for whatever the business is. There has to be some return on investment. Otherwise, people won't get involved. But If money is the biggest driver, it's going to be how can we make the money the fastest? And so I think we need to prove that there are other benefits that aren't just money, like healing the planet, our relationship with technology, our mental health, our well-being, and bringing more people in diversity into games. But it does, it does. And I think this is a, a pretty accurate picture of a reality, a part of the challenges. But we don't count when it's so important to us because it's like core values and You know, it's, it's things that keeps you going and money, it's, it comes and go, you know. <laughs> Absolutely. And I think the money will come and the abundance will come if you put your heart into doing the right thing. Mm -hmm. Totally. Okay. Well, maybe we'll come back to that a little later in the conversation. But let's go back to some former experience you had, because I think it's very impressive, like the track record you had in uh, production and also leading big teams. So I'm very curious about your time as the GM of COVID Fashion, because I know this game is very iconic and, you know, number one fashion game and also very inspiring for me when I saw it the first time out. There are games that don't look like games, you know, it's like a lifestyle. It's between apps and games. I was following as well over the years, the impact on the, I wouldn't even call players, users, uh, you know, who were actually using COVID fashion. They were really inspired by the fashion they could play with in the game. And so it, it inspired me as well a lot that games could have an impact in the real world of players like they put their inspiration in the game and there's the whole community thing so for such an iconic game i'm curious about what is the job of a gm you know what was your mission what kind of teams did you have how were you working if you can share more about that Sure. Great question with a, lots of answers. Mm -hmm. So my job as a GM was primarily to make sure that our team was motivated, inspired, and understood our long-term goals. My job was to make sure that our PNL was balanced. And my job was to make sure that the game was well promoted, that we had enough UA and marketing spend. But my job was to make sure that we were providing an experience and a platform for women or our users, mostly women, to enjoy spending their time and to connect to each other through games and through fashion. And Covet was about a 40-person team. Like I said, we had about a seven-person uh, leadership team. One of them was a male. And we had a content team that was basically creating all of the content for Covet on a day-to-day -day basis. And then we had a product management team who was looking at our KPIs and looking at our data. We had an incredible art team and a programming team, and of course, marketing and UA. And my job was to make sure that all of these teams fit together really seamlessly and to make sure that the leaders of these teams were all supported, 
they all had what they needed and that they had an idea and an understanding of their short, medium, and long-term goals. I think that authentic leadership is really important. And in order to be an authentic leader, you must make sure that you genuinely care about the people that you're working with genuinely care about them, set their goals, and make sure that everyone has a vision for the long term uh, for what Covet is going to be. So I got to do that. And I also got to do fun things like PR and go to New York Fashion Week. And wow, yeah, it was really fun and participate in, you know, working with our brands team, because Covet has real brands. That's part of what makes Covet so special, is that we had relationships with over 150 real brands. And we actually maintain those relationships and go to where they are and talk to them and meet with them. And um, the other part of Covet that's so important is the community. That is the number one thing about Covet is that people and our players and our users came together to connect over Covet fashion. And there was such a strong community. And one of the first things that my team did when we joined Covet was create an easier way to get into fashion houses, which are essentially our guilds, the group of people who play together. And that brings people together. And it's really all about connection. So to answer your question, huge team, making sure that they're motivated and making sure that we were looking forward, taking care of the team. There's a lot of HR and personnel stuff that's also involved with being a GM, really making sure the team is happy, motivated, feel safe and feel excited about what they're doing. Great. Thanks for sharing. So I do have follow-up questions as well, because it sounds to me as well, like being a GM of a game sounds almost like a company that you're leading. So if you could share about that, not specific numbers, but what kind of size of teams are we talking about here and number of teams, you mentioned a few. It sounds to me like a whole organization, you were the CEO of the game. Is is that right? I, I think that's essentially true. I think when you're a general manager, you really are the CEO of the game. You have to make sure that everything is running smoothly, that all all of the teams are interconnected. And that's everything from HR to finance to um, UA to marketing to UI to UX to art, programming, product management, community. And all of those teams have to work together really well. So yes, uh, I think I, I was the CEO of Covet, um, but I was part of the larger organization of Crowdstar, which also has Design Home and a few other projects. And so it was really fortunate to be able to partner with the leaders of Design Home as well. And gain knowledge and share knowledge with the other teams. And something that caught my attention about the type of leadership you created as well within these teams and really how much it is a challenge to hire more women in leadership position, like your own experience, most of the time I'm always the only female in the group. How did you manage to hire so many women? I made it a priority. It was an absolute priority. And sometimes it takes a little bit longer, but it's a requirement for me for the people who make the game to look like the people who play the game. And the majority of our players are women. And so the majority of our team needed to be women as well. And it's hard to find women for some of these positions. And I think making it a priority, making it kind of table stakes for who you're going to hire is really, really important. And just broadening your net and hiring somebody who may be more junior and giving her the training that she needs to step up and become a leader. I think investing in women is really, really important. And were you given the whole autonomy to exactly take your time, decide who you hire? Mm-hmm. When I joined Covet, it was not on the up. It was kind of people thought it had peaked. And so there wasn't as much attention on Covet as there was on Design Home. Mm -hmm. And so I could do what I wanted. So yes, I did have that, which is really important for a leader to have. Yeah, I totally agree. I'm happy that I had the autonomy as well, how I hired my team and to make also those choices because there's always the pressure to hire fast. Yep. And when time is the constraint, then you have not so many options because it takes time to find, to develop the trust, to grow and train. Exactly. And then if you take a little bit more time and you hire that person who has that intrinsic understanding of the player, then you're going to make more money in the long run. So you have to have a long view of it. And I think it's really, really important that we bring people in young, we train them and we give them these opportunities. That's why Wings Mobile is so important to me. When you hired that team where you had more women, did you hire as well out of games? Is this something that is a good source as well to look at? That's, that is a really good point. So with Covet, you know, we really tow the line between app and game and we're a fashion platform experience. And so we hired people who had zero 
game experience and fashion experience and was something that they were passionate about. And so we brought people in from kind of all walks. I mean, there are certain positions that really need to have game experience, like product managers, lead programmers, UI, UX people. But there are other jobs that you can bring people in from outside of the industry. That's a really good point. Sometimes we lack the confidence to do that and say it should only be games. But I see in that case as well, and sometimes being more open about it, again, part of training to get to games and there are many, many talents out of games as well. Exactly. And another thing that we did on Covet is, you know, Covet, I guess it's almost nine years old now, but we had people come to us and say, this is my favorite game ever. Is there any way I could intern for you? Or is there any way I could work for you? And we actually hired a couple of people, you know, into our content team who are just huge fans of the game. And we turned them into game developers. And now they're, you know, out there in the world doing that. So there's a lot to be said for hiring people who are passionate. Yeah, this is the best fun story, like a game you really enjoy and then you get to work on it. Isn't isn't that amazing? Exactly. (laughs) All right. So also, I'm curious a bit more before as well, your experience at places like EA when you were head of production of Sims Mobile. How different was your mission there and what kind of teams were you leading and how different was it from what you were doing as a GM? Super different. So I was very passionate about making The Sims mobile because I had worked on The Sims 2 earlier in my career and I was passionate about making mobile games. Unfortunately, when I joined... It was already a five-year-old project with different leaders coming and going. And during that year and 10 months, I had six different bosses, six Mm -hmm. different agendas. And so it was very hard to say, you know, this is what our plan is going to be. And when you work for a massive company, a lot of your job becomes creating PowerPoint decks to prove that you know what you're doing. And your entire job becomes telling other people what you want to do instead of actually doing it. So even though The Sims Mobile was a really fun game with incredibly talented people, it took so much longer and was so much more convoluted than it needed to be because so many people had to be involved in the production. And so that's what I really liked about working at Glue is, you know, I said, this is our plan and they said, go for it. And it wasn't about this kind of corporate strategy. So you know, it's really hard to gain momentum if you have to constantly prove that you know what you're doing. You need to find people who trust you. And when you get trust and you're able to perform, it's, it feels amazing. And so it was very, very different for me going from a giant 10,000 person organization like EA to going to a 700 person organization like Glue. Mm-hmm. Although now yeah. Glue, of course, is part of EA again. So. <laughs> yeah, it's like small fish and eaten by bigger fish. And <laughs> Yes, the consolidation of the industry is ridiculous right now. And I think that makes it even more important for us to support indie developers with all of the acquisitions that have been happening. It's We really need that indie voice out there. Yeah, totally. Especially for diversity of games. It's a form of art and a way of expressing how different developers see the world. Exactly. And so for your years as well of developing into uh, production direction in terms of strategy, product strategy and business, Mm -hmm. what were the tools you had to develop throughout your career? Well, I surrounded myself with really smart people. That's the secret to success is hire really smart, really passionate people and give them the tools, remove the roadblocks and let them do their job. When I was on Covet, who really helped me hold a mirror up to myself so that if I was going down the wrong path, she would say, Sarah, is that is that the right decision? And ask me questions to make sure that I was on the right path. Executive coach was invaluable. I had a coach called Christina who was just so, so instrumental in my success. Thanks, Christina. (laughs) And now that you mentioned about it, I think we tend to forget sometimes when we are in higher position that uh, we still need to keep learning and learning from others. Yes. And having a coach to develop yourself, your thinking and be more critical, as you have mentioned, is very, very beneficial I wonder here, for example, today, do you have a coach? And when is the moment, you know, that you feel that you should get one? I think it's always important to have somebody who you can talk to. There are a lot of companies will offer coaching and executive coaching. It's just about finding the right coach. It it doesn't have to be a professional coach. It could be a mentor within the industry. It could be somebody with experience. It could be somebody with a job like yours, someone who once had your job. But finding somebody who you can really bounce ideas off of is really critical. 
And your earlier point about always learning is so important. When you get to be in a very senior position, sometimes you think, oh, I've got this, but you never have this. There's always more to learn. And a really critical example of that for me came in 2020 when we were learning how to work remotely. But when the murder of George Floyd happened in the US, we really took a hard look at Covet and we realized that there were so many parts of Covet that were not inclusive and that the default was always white. And it was very shocking to me because I thought, hey, I'm an anti-racist to realize that actually the default character in Covet is white and there wasn't enough racial diversity in Covet. And so for me, it was kind of like a punch to my stomach where I was like, oh my gosh, I've failed the team here by not promoting more diversity. And the team and I did everything we could, research, brought in consultants, met with our diverse team to help us figure out what was our diversity roadmap. And for me, it was such a shock to realize we weren't doing the right thing for diversity in Covet, and we had to make a change, and we completely pivoted our roadmap. And I'm super proud. One of the last things that I was able to work on on Covet was our entire skin tone revamp that was led by our art director, Heather. And for me, that was a point of taking a learning and putting it into practice and making a difference. So there's never an opportunity where you can stop learning. There's always more to learn. I think it's a great example what you shared, because this is where you can see the power of games that there can be a social responsibility or there is if you don't care about it that could be harmful yes so uh, here again is like okay having awareness of a dramatic event and looking back to yourself with full honesty and repairing or fixing what's not right and maybe a position we don't think enough about as developers we have an influence when we have millions of players exactly and it's our responsibility and that's why you know the social aspect is so important because if players are are looking at a game and they don't see themselves represented, then they're, a little piece of them is going to hurt. And mm-hmm. Covet certainly was not perfect after our diversity initiative, and there's so much more work to be done still. But we made an entire pivot based on something because we do have a social responsibility to our players. And also in these positions, this is more like your time management. How do you manage your time where you mentioned also you have four kids, a family, mm-hmm. and you care, of course, about your family and spending time with them? Four projects you're having at the moment, how do you manage your time? So I love this question because I think it's one of the really, really important things to talk about. When I grew up in games, it was crunch time all the time. You know, I was there during the EA spouse case. I was there during lots of the lawsuits. And we worked nights and weekends and there was no overtime and there was nothing. And one of the most important things I learned is to set boundaries up front and ahead of time. So when I took the GM position, I told my boss, I told everyone, I leave at five. I leave at five every day. I go spend time with my kids. If there's a school conference, I'm going to go to it. If there's an opportunity to chaperone a field trip from time to time, I'm going to do it. And It was table stakes for me. I keep using that word. So important for me to be able to say, these are my boundaries and I will get the work done. I will hire a team that is capable and confident and competent to be able to get what we need to get done done, or I'll cut some things because we in the United States at least have this culture of glorifying overwork and glorifying exhaustion and look at all of the things I can do. And we need to change that narrative so that we glorify rest and taking care of oneself and wellness. And we can make great games without killing ourselves. We can have boundaries. We can have weekends. We can have our evenings. And I felt like it was really important for me to lead by example. I took vacations. I took time off. I left at five. And I'm not saying everyone has to do that, but they should set boundaries so that they can have time with their families. It's so important for us to change the culture of game development from one of crunch to one of creative flow. And it's going to take a lot to do that, but I think it starts with caring about people. If you truly care about somebody and you see they're so burned out, you're going to make sure that they take a break. If you don't have children, you have just as much a right to downtime and wellness as if you do have kids. It's just a very easy excuse because no one's going to tell me I can't go to dinner with my kids. And although they, they tried that early on, but it doesn't happen anymore. But if you need to do something, if you need to go to a yoga class or if you need to, you know, go for a hike, whatever you need to do to recharge, it's important that you do that and you set boundaries and you say, it can wait. 
And it's once again about money not being the only thing. But we doubled our bookings on Covet. So these practices worked. Taking care of each other worked. Hiring women worked. Making sure that we weren't crunching all the time worked. And so you have to recognize that you may have to sacrifice an immediate dollar for a much, much longer term gain, which is the health and happiness and well-being of your employees and, you know, greater financial reward by doing the right thing. Yeah. Here are very important also elements of leadership, uh, reminders as well of the expectation we should have at work. And I want to take a moment here to reflect back on many important things that you have shared. I think setting boundaries, it's something that a lot of employees don't grant for themselves, having boundaries, but it's really important in case there's abuse as well in the leadership request, like, no, I have a life and this is important for me. Exactly. So it happens both ways. So I think it's a great reminder and practice here for people who feel they're stretching too much to set boundaries. And also in the end, it's about working smarter, right? So mm -hmm. it, we are not doing factory work and the output of what we do is proportional to the amount of work and time that we put. It's about the quality and especially creative work. You need to be relaxed. You need to let your mind wander. You need to have some rest, be, you know, in good health to keep with the marathon and not the sprint you're trying to do at the moment. Yeah. Exactly. And there was a time when I remember very clearly 20 years ago when I was working on a game, everyone had to come in on the weekends. And I said to my manager, I don't have any work to do. I don't have anything to do. Well, you have to come in for moral support. And it was so crushing because back then I didn't stand up for myself. I didn't know that I could stand up for myself. And so I came in, I sat at my desk on the weekend looking at the internet, not being with my family, not being with my friends, but because I had to for moral support. And that was one of the most soul-crushing experiences, and it made me quit eventually. And mm -hmm. good employees will leave if you do things like that. Yeah. It's about thinking of things in the long run, always. And I think COVID fashion speaks for itself almost a decade and still running, still a big yep. game. You know, it's, it's amazing. So let's go now a bit back even further in your career, because I'm really interested of your path as well, especially when we think of leadership position. And it's a fact it's hard to see also more women in leadership position or in general, like more leaders. How did you get in your first leadership position in your career? How did that happen? Let's see. First leadership position. I spent a lot of time as a producer. I did a pretty good job of being organized and efficient and When people recognized that I was organized and efficient and good with people, they said, hey, do you want to be an art manager? And so I said, yes, I'd love to be an art manager. I love working with people. And it was hard to know what to do the first time. And so there was a lot of mistakes and a lot of learning that I had to do. But, you know, you kind of work your way up. You're an art manager, and then you're a producer, then you become a director, and then you have enough experience that people say, hey, we would love for you to lead this game. So I was the head of production on The Sims Mobile. When I left, I went to Covet Fashion. They said, we want you to be the VP and GM. I did take a job once just for the title, and that was a big mistake. It was my only real swing and a miss career-wise. I spent a year and a half being the VP of production at a company called Enway, which is a great company, but they were making an action RPG, not for the Western market. And I had no experience with this whatsoever, but I said, oh, VP, that's, that's the thing for me. I want to go to the next level. And so I did that. And I don't regret anything because I've learned from the experience, but that wasn't a good fit for me. Never take a job just for the title. Do I understand that part of your promotions, like you were doing a very good job in what you were doing and then it was suggested to you or is it something that you also suggested? I've definitely asked for what I feel like I deserve. I quit a couple of times and I was laid off on my maternity leave and I thought this is the worst thing ever. But then I took a few months at home with my son And I got back and I went to a job where I said, you know, I only want to work three days a week now because I've got a baby and then build back up to it. 
And there was an awesome opportunity in Indy and San Francisco. And they said, no, we need you full time. And Jimoko and actually Carol Shaw was my manager. And she said, you know, you can work three days a week. we'll, We'll make it work for you to come back as a mom. And that was like a real turning point for me. I took kind of a step back career wise to work three days a week and then was able to build back up and build back up. And then I was coming up with good ideas for product and for people. And so people just kept giving me opportunity. And every opportunity that was presented to me that was exciting to me, I took it. And I think that's part of it. You have to leap into the next opportunity. And take the opportunity and create your next one. Exactly. Very inspiring. So you also talked a little bit about your transition, of course, from EA to Glue, but you mentioned it as well when you were a GM at Covet Passion, there was the acquisition, but was it the main reason or what was the change that was happening for you career-wise that it was time for you to not stay in games close to production or, you know, like a hands-on role? What made me leave Covet, you mean? Yes. It was the acquisition. So I'd worked for EA three times. This was my fourth time. Mm -hmm. And what I discovered is that I don't like working in a large corporation. And a 10,000 person organization where you have to be kind of a, a cog in the wheel instead of having impact, that was it for me. I really wanted to have impact. I want my time, you know, like I said before, my time's very valuable. I've got four kids, I've got a family, I've got things I want to do. I want to spend my time doing something that's really high value to me and kind of being a cog in a wheel in a big machine, even if it's a great machine, is not something that's interesting to me. So I wanted to forge my own path doing something that was really meaningful to me. So I loved my team. I loved Covet. I was heartbroken to leave Covet. It's one of the, but it was time for me to move on because I didn't want to be lost. I mean, EA is 10,000 plus people Mm -hmm. and it's easy to get lost. Yeah. And then it totally explained as well the initiative you took to make a big impact with the time that you are willing to invest. I think it's also the more you grow in your career, you know, and the skills you have, how can you create more value for the time you invest and not the opposite, you know, put more time in the same value. And I I think that describes very well what you've been doing and for the projects you are leading next. Exactly. That's really important to me. And also, is what I'm doing, does it matter? How am I spending my time? Does it matter? Am I making a difference in people's lives? That's really important to me as well. And how can I use this experience I've had and the medium of games to make the world a better place? And if I can spend my time doing that, then I am winning all the time. And you design then, you know, your life and your projects to be really fully aligned with your values. So it's, again, very inspiring. Thank you. And so a few reflection questions as well, as you have also a very big career with all the things you've learned, and I'm sure you learn a lot of things also the hard way. What would you tell your younger self in her early 20s if you would have that conversation today? Set boundaries. Don't let yourself get pushed around. Don't let yourself get bullied or talked over. In a meeting, if another woman gets interrupted, say, hey, hang on, Sophie was speaking. Let her finish her point. Look out for other women. Bring other women up. And make sure that you are living a life that's meaningful and you don't go home at the end of the day and feel like I wasted my time. Wow. Great pieces of wisdom. For someone who would like to develop to such a high position, like to a VP level, GM, what would you be your advice in terms of skills to develop to get there? Empathy, people skills, communication. Understand that people are the key to this business, that people are the most important piece of any puzzle and make sure that you can have a high degree of emotional intelligence so that you can motivate people, you can inspire people to do their best work, and that you can communicate effectively. I think it's all about people. And as we're reaching the end as well, I would like to take a moment to discuss also more about the exciting initiative you mentioned about Wings and the mobile uh, fund. If you can Share more about it and for whoever is interested and how can we help, you know? Absolutely. So Wings is an amazing organization that has already existed for PC and console. And its sole purpose is to bring more women developers into games. And for a while now, they've been funding these developers and have had to turn down mobile developers because they don't have mobile expertise. And so I've put together a board of amazing mobile female leaders to evaluate games and working on getting more funding for mobile so that we can have the ability to fund female-led 
startups. And so that's what we want to do. So if you have a startup that you're trying to get funded, go to the Wings website, wingsfund.me, I think, and reach out to us because we want to help you achieve your vision. That's great. And maybe if you understand as well more how important this initiative is, what are the current challenges that exist for this particular audience looking for funds in games? Yeah, it's hard to get funding. You know, now I think more people are waking up to the fact that women are incredible and make amazing product. But for a long time, the VC funding was a kind of a bro scene and it's about who you know, and it's easier for men traditionally to get funding. And so that is leaving half of the ideas on the table from the amazing 50% of the world that are women. And there are so many gamers who are women. So it is challenging to get funding. Hopefully now it's going to be easier, but we know that the next great huge hit is going to be a women-led hit. And we want to make sure that we're in there backing them up. Yeah, I'm very excited about that and looking forward to hearing more. And I'm so happy that that kind of initiative and women like you and Audrey are really committed to this. I think it's great. Thank you so much. I'm really excited about giving women the opportunity to shine and having them not have to worry about where the money's coming from so that they are just able to create. Yeah, and that should be the focus for great products. Okay, so we reached the end and I'd like to end it also with three rapid fire questions. Okay. So I will ask my questions and just answer with whatever comes to your mind. Okay? Okay. So what is the thing that is occupying the most your thoughts with these days? Oh, let's see. Rapid fire. Most occupying my thoughts right now is how to use my skills and talent to make the world a better place. Second question. What is the thing you fear the most these days? Oh, well, it's not COVID anymore because I got it and I've recovered. So that there was that. What I fear the most these days is people not realizing that climate change is an impending disaster and continuing to live their lives in kind of a wasteful manner. And at last, what is your motto in life? Ooh, that's a great question. I think be kind, be patient, listen, and spread love. Very inspiring. Mm -hmm. I reflect a lot on what you shared today. It sparked new ideas. So thanks a lot, Sarah, for sharing all your experience, wisdom, and excitement on the new projects. I really enjoyed our conversation. Me too. Thank you so much for having me. Take care. Bye. Thanks for listening to this new episode of Raise and Play podcast. If you enjoyed the content and want to support what we're doing, rate and review the podcast. Spread the word about it. If you'd like to contribute to the change too, reach out to me on LinkedIn for a collaboration. You'll find all the rest of the content on riseandplay.io, including my free masterclass on conscious leadership, how to hire a team with a vision, or how to lead and build a team for the long-term game. Until the next time. <laughs>